The human body generates a lot of waste products, and fortunately, our kidneys are capable of getting rid of most of them. However, there is one arch nemesis that the kidney can't deal with on its own. So, the liver comes to the rescue, and that villain is ammonia. Ammonia is the major toxin that results from the metabolism of amino acids. Amino acids are made up of a nitrogen group, a carbon skeleton, and a side chain that is unique to each amino acid. When amino acids are metabolized, the nitrogen is formed into ammonia, and ammonia is toxic to the cells. So, the ammonia is shuttled over to the liver and sent through the urea cycle, which is a series of enzymatic reactions that convert ammonia into urea. The urea cycle takes place within the mitochondria, so that it doesn't affect proteins and organelles in our cytoplasm. Urea can be then easily dealt with by the kidney. It's a bit like how a mama bird might mash up a worm so that it's easier for a baby bird to digest. In this case, the liver is the mama bird, and the kidney is the little baby bird. Alright, so first, ammonia needs to get to the liver. And it has to be done carefully, because it's toxic. So, much like a prisoner, it needs to be carried into the circulation by a police officer to its prison, which is the liver mitochondria. There are two ways this can happen. The first way is used by cells throughout the body. The enzyme glutamine synthetase adds ammonia to the amino acid glutamate, forming glutamine. Glutamine can move into the blood and essentially transport ammonia around the block until it gets to a liver cell. Once inside the mitochondria of a liver cell, an enzyme called glutaminase cleaves glutamine back into glutamate and ammonia, and the ammonia can then enter the urea cycle. The second way to move ammonia around is done mostly by skeletal muscle cells. In skeletal muscle cells, the enzyme glutamate dehydrogenase incorporates ammonia into the molecule alpha-ketoglutarate, and it turns into glutamate. But, unlike glutamine, glutamate can't leave the cell on its own. It needs to somehow give its ammonia to an amino acid that can leave the cell, and the one it chooses is alanine. So, the enzyme alanine transaminase, or ALT, converts glutamate and pyruvate into alpha-ketoglutarate and alanine. Alanine then moves into the blood and ends up transporting ammonia to a liver cell. And once there, it undergoes the reverse of the previous reactions. The enzyme alanine transaminase converts alanine and alpha-ketoglutarate back into pyruvate and glutamate. At this point, the ammonia is now part of glutamate once again. Okay, so these two pathways both end up at the same point in the liver cell in the form of glutamate. From there, glutamate has two possible outcomes. The first is for it to encounter the same enzyme that incorporated ammonia into glutamate, glutamate dehydrogenase and to have the ammonia snatched away from the glutamate, converting it back into alpha-ketoglutarate and a free ammonia that enters the urea cycle. And since this reaction can happen in both directions, we call it a reversible reaction. The second outcome is for glutamate to encounter the enzyme aspartate transaminase, or AST, and combine with oxaloacetate to form aspartate and alpha-ketoglutarate. As before, the amino acid aspartate is carrying the ammonia group, and aspartate will directly enter the urea cycle. In fact, it's the only amino acid to actually do that. Alright, now that we have ammonia in the liver, the urea cycle can begin. The urea cycle is made up of a series of enzymatic reactions that modify the chemical structure of substrates within it until it ultimately results in the molecule urea. Urea is made of two nitrogen groups and one carbonyl group. Think of the enzymes involved in the urea cycle as children playing around with clay, changing its shape until the clay looks like urea. And that sounds like fun. Okay, so the first two steps of the urea cycle take place in the mitochondria, and the rest happens in the cytoplasm. 
To kick things off, the participants in the first reaction are ammonia, carbon dioxide, and two adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, molecules. An enzyme called carbamoyl phosphate synthetase 1, or CPS1, converts these into a molecule called carbamoyl phosphate. If we break down the name of this molecule, carb refers to the carboxyl group provided by carbon dioxide. Amoyl refers to the nitrogen group provided by ammonia. And phosphate refers to the phosphate group that comes from one of the two ATP molecules. Now, this process can be sped up or slowed down based on the affinity of carbamoyl phosphate synthetase 1 for ammonia. A molecule called N-acetylglutamate allosterically activates CPS1, meaning that it binds to the CPS1 on a site different from where ammonia binds. When it binds, N-acetylglutamate modifies the physical shape of CPS1 so that it can process ammonia more efficiently, increasing the rate of urea synthesis. Now, N-acetylglutamate itself is made by a mitochondrial enzyme called N-acetylglutamate synthetase, which combines glutamate and acetyl-CoA. And having enough N-acetylglutamate around is crucial because without it, CPS1 has a very low affinity for ammonia. In fact, having a genetic deficiency in N-acetylglutamate can lead to ammonia building up to toxic levels. In the second step of the urea cycle, also in the mitochondria, the enzyme ornithine transcarbamoylase combines the molecule ornithine with the carbamoyl part of carbamoyl phosphate to form citrulline, releasing free phosphate in the process. In fact, deficiency of ornithine transcarbamoylase is the most common genetic cause of increased ammonia levels, or hyperammonemia. Next, citrulline goes from the mitochondria to the cytoplasm, where it meets up with aspartate. The enzyme arginosuccinate synthetase uses the energy of an ATP molecule to combine citrulline with aspartate to make arginosuccinate. So now aspartate has provided the second and final nitrogen group, which will be part of the final urea structure. But we have to continue playing with the clay until we fully get urea. Next, the enzyme arginosuccinate lyase breaks up arginosuccinate into two molecules, fumarate and arginine. Let's start with fumarate. Fumarate is first converted to malate, and then the enzyme malate dehydrogenase converts malate to oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate and glutamate are converted to aspartate and alpha-ketoglutarate by the enzyme aspartate transaminase, or AST. This regenerates aspartate so that it may enter the next urea cycle. Next, there's arginine. Arginine is broken down by arginase to make urea, and also ornithine. Urea finally exits the liver cell, enters the blood, and gets excreted by the kidneys, whereas ornithine heads the other way and enters the mitochondria, so that it can enter the next urea cycle as well. All right, as a quick recap, all the amino acids, with the exception of aspartate, are metabolized into a nitrogen-containing toxic compound called ammonia. In liver cells, Aspartate and ammonia provide the two nitrogens necessary to make the less toxic urea in the urea cycle. In the liver mitochondria, carbamoyl phosphate synthetase 1 requires allosteric activation from N-acetylglutamate to bind ammonia. Once urea is formed, it can go off into the bloodstream and get excreted by the kidneys.